And we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Catfish and Crappie podcast. I'm going to start out by saying hello to the people in chat. It looks like Lyle's not quite done yet, but uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, always glad you guys are here. All right. I'm going to say hello to Two Stands Fishing. I want to say hello to Betty. Betty was in here. I think she's listening in the background. Air Run, what's going on? Uh, Catfish Fever and Outdoors. Creole Catfishing, Ernie Brown. Fins and Finds. Uh, Fishing Cooking with Mike Chavez. Has Life, what's going on, Has? Uh, Jeff Baker, John Boy Catfishing, Justin's Fishing Fetish, Mo Creek Fishing, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Gadget Fishing, Muskrat Adventures, what's up, Roger, Papa Ed, Robert Andrews, uh, the Bullock Experience, Wandering Fisherman, the Weekend Angler, what's up, Josh, Thomas Littlepage, Tr and Trey uh, Straup. Uh, let's see if anybody else came in. There's a lot of Central Valley Adventures. That's a new one. Hello. Chad Nolte, what's up? Creole Catfishing, if I didn't say hello to you. I'm saying it to you now. If I said it to you twice, you're worth two hellos, my brother. Uh, Dale Hayslip, Daniel Ishmael, Ernie Brown. Uh, I'm going through this. Fishing with the Chad. What's up, Chad? Fishing cooking with Mike Chavez. What's going on, Mike? Uh, James Dockery fishing. What's up, my friend? I'm um, being nice to James because he deserves it. Uh, Mr. Gadget fishing. Mo Muskrat, Papa Ed. Uh, Robert Edge. Lots of people keep coming in. Sean Abney. It's hard to keep up with all the new people in here. Two old vets. And so on. <clears throat> All right, people. Um, thanks for showing up. I do do this show as a podcast. So uh, I'm going to start the show like right now. We'll make the announcements. I'll bring our guests in and we'll go from there just so you guys know what's going on. Thank you and good evening. Welcome to the Catfish and Crappie podcast. Today's guests is Justin and Josh from Russell Marine Products. What's going on, gentlemen? How are you? Great. Yeah. How are you? Good. I'm so happy to see you. I'm so excited. I've been such a fanboy of your YouTube channel and your products or your, your shop, I should say. Um, I check you guys out on Instagram and stuff for, for a while now. Um, links in the description if you guys want to be fanboys too. Um, <laughs> check them out. They're all down there. Uh, we'll get around to that. So uh, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate you having you. Um, so let's get started. So how'd you guys get started? Oh, okay. Maybe you should introduce yourself so that people know who Justin and who Josh is. Hi, I'm Justin, Justin Russell. I'm Josh Schneider. Hi, guys. And how did you get into the business, gentlemen? Man, um, I've always been around fishing, boating, outdoors my entire life. You know, I was fortunate enough to have a family member, my dad, that got me into fishing and stuff. And, man, it just it got into me. I was ate up by it ever since I was a little kid. And, you know, uh, how I got into business uh, – I really had goals and dreams and ambitions of trying to fish professionally after college and stuff like that. Tried it and man, it's way harder than what you think it is. You know, it's not as easy as it seems. So failed at it miserably. Um, but one of the things I was kind of always known for fishing the opens and fishing at the time, the ever starts and stuff like that, what they were called. Um, I was always kind of known as electronics. I knew how to network Lorant stuff, knew how to read them. Um, was kind of on the forefront of some early hummingbird side imaging stuff when it first came out. So people would catch me in a lock or they'd kind of recognize me around from the Midwest and, hey, can you set up my units for me and stuff? And so I was always wanting to help people out. Got started setting people's units up for them, which ultimately was my competition, you know. And uh, guys were like, man, you should sell this stuff. You know, you know enough about it. And one thing kind of led to another and shoot. 15 years later, here we are, you know, so big shop and a lot of employees. And we have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Um, I came on with them a couple years ago. Um, I spent about a decade in outdoors retail. I'm um, just working for big box stores, bouncing around, hunting stuff, bows, fishing gear, everything you did and got on with these guys a couple years ago and have looked back, had a ball. Yeah, had been a ball. <laughs> I sure you. I know you guys keep busy just from the the, the looks of you on your social media and all the pictures and stuff. So the big question is: Do you guys still find time to fish? Not <laughs> as much as we used to, ironically enough. You know what I mean? But you know, a lot of it when we get a chance to go out, it's hey, we're going to go out and do some filming, and then we're going to spend yeah. four or five hours fishing and stuff. There like you that. go. 
Now, uh, take it- fun of fun because we do make it a priority. So we're located right near El Dorado Lake, near El Dorado, Kansas, right in the Midwest here. And they got a Wednesday night jackpot every other Wednesday during the summer for bass. So we make it a point. Everybody that works here generally fishes and owns a boat. So it's we're all hightailing out of here right at five o'clock. We go show up to the <laughs> jackpots and we kind of have our own little side bet side pot as to what RMP team is going to perform the best and win the side pot and stuff like that. So we still get out absolutely as often as we can but man it's it's been cold here ice out came out what a week ago yeah so still really cold but we're looking forward to getting out and at least doing some crappie fishing out there before we start chasing the bass it's fun uh like you said on the videos anytime you guys watch the videos behind the cameraman there's always at least one person fishing if not two (laughs) <laughs> you can kind of hear it sometimes you'll hear a cast, cast. <laughs> a shadow of somebody casting in the yeah it's definitely going we, we uh, you're, you're broadcasting to a, to a lot of uh, uh anglers out there so I, I really don't think they mind uh hold on uh, roger's got a question already we'll, we'll start out so i don't lose this question roger says he's getting interference from his trolling motor on a which is a 112 Terra Nova, two Garmin 93 SVs, which was a hot buy this Christmas time, wasn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, graphs are on their own batteries. Any advice? I mean, it's possible that you're getting interference there. It depends on what's coming across the screen. Yep. Um, a lot of times, believe it or not, when we're seeing interference, especially if you have it wired correctly, if you've got independent batteries, you might have something with like a, a cracked magnet in the motor. And we see that things where the troll motor still functions but there's actually issues no internally with it. Yeah. That's causing okay. just the feedback. Oh, so you, it could actually be the actual trolling motor. Not because yeah, I know people motor, are always motor. You could have a damaged magnet in it just from running down the lake vibration and stuff. Yeah. Another thing that's very common on Minn Kota products that we've seen. If you have a three bank or four bank battery charger, so you've got three trolling motor batteries on a charger and the same charger is a four bank. So you got the cranking battery take the leads off the cranking battery. We are getting some uh, feedback from the charger that's crossing over to the crank battery as well, too. That can cause interference also. Uh, So that's a great tip right off the bat, man. I I would think check your electronics and your electronics wiring, but that's not it. Well, again, again, yeah, it it can be. I'm reading it here on the bottom. Sorry, I'm like, oh, that's not just it. Yeah. (laughs) But if he's uh, if he's got the ba- the units independently wired, then that should rule that out in theory. Okay, cool, very cool. All right, so back to that. Yeah, I can get on board with an employer that uh, uh, recommends you go fish that uh, every other week with everybody. <laughs> so I'm all, all for that. So it's already with this question, enjoy it. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, we have a lot of people. I know we have uh, a lot of people out in, in chat today. We're, we're at 66 already. It's climbing fast that have uh, electronics in their boat. So they're, they're uh, I wouldn't say power users, but they are users. So maybe give like a, a high level explanation of what exactly um, a fish finder is, what it does, how it works and so on. High Absolutely. level. Absolutely. Honestly, in its easiest function, you're looking at 2D sonar trying to mark and find fish, you know, looking for structure, um, whether that's rock piles, brush piles. Um, In our case out here where we're on big old mud flats, basically, we're looking for creek channels, twists, turns, bends. You know, right now you're getting a lot of catfish that are moving up onto the flats and stuff like that. We're trying to follow the shack. So same thing with crappie, you know, in its easiest form, again, I mean, we can simplify it down, but as the locators, even your very entry level locators are getting a lot more complicated as to what they can do and show. I mean, even your basic fish finder anymore is going to have capability a lot of times for side imaging, down imaging, 2D sonar and GPS. Yeah, it's moving faster and faster. Every year there, there comes out stuff. After they have their clearance sale at the end of the year, you, you know you got something to look forward to. So, <laughs> Man, those 93s um, that hit towards the end of last year, that's a, Man, that's, a, that's a heck of a lot. Yeah, buy. and it's an awesome. Yeah. You, I mean, yeah. from from capabilities of side imaging, down imaging, 2D sonar, and really good mapping and stuff, you want to talk about throwing live scope in there, which is kind of the, the rave, especially on the crappie side for the past mm-hmm. two, two and a half years. Yeah. That's kind of what the talk's been about. But we're finding so many more applications for live scope than we ever thought possible. Um, guys down at Keystone Lake, Oklahoma, using it for snag and spoonbill, ironically yeah. enough. Ooh. Right. Absolutely crushing monster, monster uh, spoonbill right now with LiveScope. I know a lot of catfish guys use it for bait more than anything. Yeah, 100%. big time. Cast and that's you know? 
We've got one running back here. Maybe difficult to see on your screen, but mm -hmm. I think the number one underrated um, accessory with a Garmin Live Scope is this perspective mode mount here. It's a hundred bucks, but talk about like what I was talking about earlier the the catfish and finding the shad on the flats and stuff like that. Finding little creek channel bends. I mean. You take a guesswork out of it, and then you just trying to aim to make sure your cast net hits what it is in the cone. Yeah. All right. Since we're 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 at the the basics level here, um, Country Boy Catfishing has a good question. He says, uh, "What is the easiest and most angler friendly unit uh, for those who are new to electronics?" I I feel like we're in agreement here. The Garmin's are the most user friendly in general. Um, if you kind of put them in order, so the Garmin's are very intuitive with their buttons and how you push it and how they describe things you menu know. is menu yeah. you know it's Bathroom, very basic yeah home. i mean it's just really intuitive um lawrence comes in in our opinion pretty close second and then humminbird would be the most complicated to run uh but the garments are really straightforward if someone comes in and they said i've never had electronics before what do you recommend and nine and a half times out of ten we're going to go you know we recommend you go with the garment they're going to be the most straightforward for you and I want to make this clear. They're all pretty dang easy to operate and function. Mm -hmm. It's just the guys that have never really been on one or turned one on before, the Garmin just seems to be easier mm -hmm. at that regard. If you ask what's easiest to me, it's Lowrance because I've been using one for right. 20 years. And I know I like the back mm -hmm. of my hand. But again, from no experience necessarily walking in and actually playing with one and operating it, Garmin seems to be the easiest by far for everybody. So let me ask you this. Um, out of the box, I know that Garmin's pretty good out of the box as far as all the standard settings they and stuff. Are. They all are okay. That's yeah, good to know. See, really you're are. just you're just making it more difficult for me to pick my next unit here. <laughs> well, and here's and here's how I like to relate this. So, so if you were telling me, hey, I want to come in and order a new unit, I don't know which one to get. I would ask. We kind of have a standard procedure for questions to ask you. What are you familiar with? So if you've grown up with Humminbird stuff and you know it like the back of my hand, nine times out of 10, I'm going to keep steering you towards Humminbird just because you're already familiar with the operating system. You're familiar with what the screen functions are, what they look like and everything like that. Now, if you said, man, I don't really care. I want the best for live imaging or I want the best for side imaging. That's a different conversation. We're going to go down a different path on that. So it really comes up to what is your preferences what is your uses for that electronics because it's truly customizable to what it is and i i couldn't agree with that more I, at least the fact of going to see somebody that that's a professional that can really pay off i mean there's there it, it i can understand putting this stuff in yourself but getting matched up with gear if they're just you know calling you guys up and and, and ordered from you and and that's the thing that i want everybody to understand too though deals on uh marine electronics aren't really a thing you no. get your you get your discounts every now and then you know at black friday events maybe uh you get your rebates and i understand i know there's a couple of rebates going on now right there's yeah. a two hundred dollars for garmin i know there's a one thousand to a thousand dollars depending on your unit is that for hummingbird or low ranch yeah that's so for lance the one. yeah it's a tiered it starts i think 200 uh, 100 bucks 100 bucks 100, 100 to 1000 it's a really complicated <laughs> it is it, it always is and you know um and that's another reason to call somebody like you or call you guys actually it would be you could help them navigate as to what they need match their needs with with whatever deal you can get or package well that's, and 90 percent of what we see like with customers having um issues or things not operating correctly it's installation issues whether that's uh -huh. trains or not being mounted correctly and power related issues from not running correct power to your unit as well too if you makes, you talked about watching the channel, something we constantly are is clean, dedicated power. You know, we right. need to make sure. Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah, uh, you're not kidding. You got me looking at like these the the, the high dollar lithium batteries too for my well, next setup. So yeah. thanks a lot. Realize, these are computer <laughs> systems here, so they absolutely. Way, are. The way that we're we've been told from a lot of the electronics manufacturers, you know, when you take a battery lithium, AGM, lead acid, you want a big mm -hmm. battery, group 31 series. You know, you start off with a fire hose and if you use the wrong gauge wire, you trickle down to garden hose pretty quick. Yeah. You're not getting the flow of juice that you need to the unit correctly. Once they start getting low voltage, man, they do some funky stuff. They do some yeah. weird stuff. 
I'm I'm actually a licensed ham radio operator, so I kind of know yeah. about that whole aspect with broadcasting signals and 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 power to those units that are creating sick signals. I know how easy it can be to screw that up. So, oh, yeah. and and when you're trying to display it on a screen, it's magnified over you know a speaker. The human ear can't hear it, but your eyes sure can't see it when it's being you know. Uh, displayed on a screen so but anyway uh mr gadget fishing he's got a question here let's see um question hook two seven split shot versus triple shot i have a triple shot and the transducer is too big uh for a trolling motor can i run a split shot transducer on the hook two uh that comes with the triple shot sure i don't can. know what any of that means okay yeah. well there you go so down imaging in 2d sonar versus side imaging down imaging in 2d sonar so yeah absolutely can sure can well, and since we uh, have you here and we're talking about trolling motors, um, let's say on an Altera or Tarova, right? Those are the ones that have built in uh, transducers, correct? Or am I mistaken? Okay. Yeah, they Most can. Of them yeah. Now, yeah. Almost all of them do now, yeah. yeah. Uh, they all do. Are, are they actually doing um, the high def or the 2D? I know they do 2D. Are they doing the. Uh, they're I doing forget the what they're spec, uh, chirp, yep. And they're adding those. Man, I should have waited a year, but that's okay. That We're was actually well, new about a year ago. Yeah. With the, yeah. The MDI Probably. and the MSI have the high dual definition chirp. Okay, cool. And what, as a, what kind of workarounds are there to, to get that image up front? There's some good ones. Um, honestly, with the Mincotas especially, how the trolling motor, the side imaging or down imaging uh, transducer is integrated it's there it is fixed it is molded into the the trolling motor so if you're ever to hit a rock or um, your units get newer pretty much protected honestly the, yeah and but if, if something cracks it's there mm -hmm. so if as opposed to an externally mounted transducer on that trolling motor if something happens your whole trolling motor doesn't go down you just fix the transducer and move on about your business um, as opposed to, okay, my transducer's cracked. Now I have to take my entire trolling motor to a service ASC center. center and wait for parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and so the workaround is actually what we generally recommend, which is get a good transducer for your unit and mount it externally. Alteras and Tarovas are a little more tricky they are. because of the cable routing, but there mm -hmm. are some really good products out there for cable management and um, things like I've, that I've, to get around that. And that's something that you guys offer as well the cable management for sub yeah. units yeah yeah and everybody in chat just so you know they're they're big trolling motor dealers as well correct and oh, yeah. and with and well, with the shallow water yeah. anchors and all that stuff yeah yeah just want to make sure everybody knows all right real quick uh before we go forward i want to let everybody know uh in my last video i said i was going to give away uh i got a ton of these uh whisker seeker decals uh i'm going to throw in one of my decals i'm going to throw in one of james dockery's angry fishing decals and the guys over at russell marine products were nice enough to throw in one of theirs uh we'll give that away later in the show so if you guys could go out and share the link get some more people in here that'd be fantastic uh we'll get that uh drawn after the show if you guys hang around that'll be cool all right, so um, <clears throat> let's talk uh, side scan. Um, what are your recommendation, recommendations for getting the best picture? I know speed has a lot to do with it. I learned that by putting my, you know, 73 SV on my kayak at first. Figured I really had to figure that one out the hard way. Right. Uh, now in my boat, That's you know, if I got it. Yeah. <clears throat> Now I got them on my boat. I got to settle, uh, figured out where I'm at. 2.8 miles an hour gives me the best, uh, um, gives me the best image going upstream. Downstream, I got to go like 2.4. It's weird, but I can get like crystal clear pictures. And I'm running like a 5200 transducer, and they're what up to a 5600 in the Garmin's now a UHD. GT 56, 56 yeah, yeah, that's their new GT 56. And uh, you know you can control some of that with scroll speed as well. Um, when you're setting your your scroll speed on your side imaging, um, it starts looking pretty good. You can really match that to what you're comfortable with or what speed mm -hmm. you're needing to move. Um, we've had some guys, um, a catfishing guy specifically, talk about just cranking his scroll speed literally down to zero. And if he's got a, a windy enough day, he can drift and still get side imaging as long as he's got that that scroll speed pegged down to zero. Um, so that that comes into play quite a bit. And then it, the other one's kind of keeping your ranges under control. Mm -hmm. um, guys want to really just max that out and get the side imaging out as far as they can. And even though, you know, the manufacturers like 150 feet, you know, either side, it'll get there, but it's not going to get there with much definition. You're splitting pixels on the display. Correct. 100%. Yeah. So, 100%. you know, keep your field of view down a little tighter 
and keep your scroll your scroll speed set to where you're running at and you're going to get a lot better image out of it the main kind of rule of thumb typically is you want three times out as you are deep so if you're in 20 feet of water you're going to be looking out 60 feet and a reason for that is a lot of these transducers now gt56 you're running a lot more power so your definition is going to be better but you're not going to see out as far as your range yeah. so if you run a lower frequency you generally can see out further but you're not going to have this quality of images and stuff so some of what you're talking about is what is you know side imaging makes it better and stuff like that honestly as with anything it just comes around to kind of understanding what the different frequencies do what your unit is it's really learning that stuff whether diving into youtube videos talking to us or spending time mm -hmm. on the water just understanding your unit is a big key to that as to why you can have success i mean we constantly have people i don't like my hummingbird i don't like my lorance i don't like my garmin we know they're just switching brands in hopes that it's the brand that's going to make it easier right the mad right not the they're camp. hoping it's the magic bullet and it usually right. isn't right. so yeah i totally get that and and real quick um uh if you could explain frequency to everybody, because, you know, everybody, a lot of people that talk to me about it, they're like, well, what frequency do I need to use? And I'm like, well, what are you trying to see? And what are you trying to do? Right. Um, not, not that a lower frequency is any worse than a higher frequency or it'll give you a better picture. It depends is the answer. Depends on the context. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. The main thing we see with differences of frequencies comes into play, especially with your side imaging type stuff, down imaging, Side imaging frequencies are very, very big deal. And your 2D sonar stuff, you're going to see some difference in frequencies as well, too. But where Chirp comes in is where the 2D sonar really, really shines. So with Chirp, instead of operating at 83 or 200, you're operating at a range of frequencies, 83, 84, 85, 200, back up and mm -hmm. back down. That's where you get that target separation on there. You know, we get some guys that your basic stuff or your basic 2D sonar chirp with your hummingbird that's built in, your Garmin, your Lowrance is really, really good. Now, if we know somebody that says, hey, I want the absolute best 2D chirp sonar on there, what transducer do I need? Airmar yeah. makes some great ones. They're expensive. They're not mm -hmm. They're not real cost effective, but man, it'll... They're clean. Yeah, it very, very clean. clean. I mean, you're seeing individual bait fish on 2D, but... I personally think I can see that with changing the frequencies on down imaging or side imaging, for example, and see everything that I want to see. And depth has a lot to do with what frequency you should be using, water clarity as well, right? Well, exactly. So we get a lot of people, well, my clarity on the 2D isn't as good as my buddy's. What's up with that? I've got the same unit, same transducer, same settings. Well, your buddy's at Table Rock. It's got 30 feel of visibility, and you're here in El Dorado. It's got two inches. You've got more de debris floating in the water, more trash and gunk. It's going to be yeah. not. As yeah, the signals get it's bouncing off where it's not coming right. back. It's acting like a filter in the water. So, hundred yeah. percent, I, I can definitely understand that, and hope everybody in chat kind of gets it. If not, you can talk to me later. Okay, we got a quick question now. SK is crappie catching adventures. SK is a heck of a heck of a crappie fisherman. I everybody thinks he doesn't need sonar, but <laughs> I think he's he's looking to get. Uh, this Hummerbird Mega Live, he's really we're like waiting on that. Any news on that for the man? Ye yes. Um, so we got a little bit of news last week. Um, you know, we have some, we have customers have it on order right now. So we are doing everything we can to get it as soon as possible. That's obviously limited to when it's built. <laughs> so initially it was slated to launch this month. Um, according to what we're hearing, um, it's going to be April, May, um, uh, before we get any availability there, most likely May, you know, a lot um, of what's occurred industry wide. Yeah. So, I mean, boat manufacturers, electronic manufacturers, tackle manufacturers, COVID is one, one thing pretty rampant within us. So we saw this massive kind of shutdown real quick of everybody tightening up on supply mm -hmm. chain stuff and then realizing the economy is just really exploded for the outdoor realm. Trying to get everything back going has been a very, very big dilemma and stuff like that, especially with bringing in brand new product and stuff. So yeah. it's, it's, it's the, the perfect storm, right? hundred percent. It, yeah. It's, yeah. Highest. And that's all the brands, <laughs> all of really, like Garmin, Lowrance, Hummingbird, they're all having supply chain issues right now. Nothing like putting a, record demands on a literally a global supply chain meltdown yeah. um, it's just it's it's rough right now it's crazy james dockery asks what would be the best unit for the average fisherman to fish out of a kayak that won't break the bank man the the little garmin striker yeah. um yeah. hummingbird helix lorance hook series um elite series there's man they're all really really good i i 
I think too many people try to position one brand or one unit as the magic answer. And again, it comes down to just understanding what your unit is and spending time on the water. I mean, nothing is going to replace time on the water at all. And time with your unit. That, that took me a while. Yeah. Once I spend some time with my electronics, watch some videos, read the manual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, what right, we um, recommend people do, when you get the when you pick up a new boat install from us, go to the lake for eight hours, ten hours, whatever it is. Leave your rods at home. Yeah, mm -hmm. truly, it's tough, but it, yeah, it, that, that, no, no, you can't. You can say that all you want. It's not happening with me. Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Justin. I can't leave with. I can't leave my house without a rod in my truck, let alone go on. <laughs> I water. know it's hard, but man, just oh. go to a lake where you know some structure is that you have an idea. Um, yeah. I'll be honest. One of the first times I really kind of had an aha or epiphany moment. There's a spot out on El Dorado Lake. I swore nobody else knew what it was. Always a big rock pile or what I thought was a rock pile there and could always catch fish, but I broke a lot of them off. Occasionally I'd catch a small mouth and actually get it into the boat, go wait in. But I never understood why I, I kept breaking fish off and it looked like a rock pile. Well, I found it was actually old bridge rubble where they pushed a bridge down in the lake and you can see the guardrail. Well, I had no idea. Every time I was casting my line, I was literally casting over metal. Oh. When I get bit and set the hook, I'm pulling my fishing line directly over that piece of guardrail. So all I had to do was change my boat position to where I could line up a cast differently where I wasn't casting over that. That, that makes sense. You know what I did when I first started using side scan in, in my boat is um, I fish I'd fish a lot of rivers, or at least that, that at that time I was. And there's laydowns everywhere. Drive by that. Drive by that laydown. You know, part of that tree is underwater. Right. Yeah. Until yeah. you can figure out how to get a clear picture of that tree. I kept people must have thought I was crazy because it's heavily populated area. I'm doing circles by this tree, circles by this tree for like a half hour, but I got it figured out and tuned in. So that's well, kind of the angle. And that's know. the key to that yeah. too. So if you've got a tree, you know, let's say that tree's laying to the north. So the branches mm -hmm. are facing to the north. So it, it's sticking up kind of like this. You want your boat up here casting to the tree branches to come through the tree. You don't want your boat on the south end of it casting to the north and getting hung up in the tree branches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of it's just applying what you learn, kind of applying some common sense to that as well, too. But obviously, you can't always fish that way if you've got wind or waves conditions and stuff like that. But, you know, you want to make it to where you've got more high percentage areas, more high percentage cast. To, you know, it's number of statistics and what it is on catching fish. No matter well, no matter what species of fish, guys. You know, really just so you know, definitely you know. If um, question from fishing with squirrel, uh, running a Lawrence active imaging transducer, would I benefit from installing a higher end? Uh, I don't know what that word is. Almar Almar two D chirp transducer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You get way better target separation. You're going to see fish hugging directly on the bottom better. You're going to see bait fish in trees and brush piles a lot easier. That Airmar 2D sonar transducer 100% is the best 2D sonar on the market, in my opinion, for a Lorance unit. It is damn good. Very cool. And target separation is exactly what you said, so you'd be able to see specific targets You're seeing in the water. tree branches fish. instead of a blob. You're seeing mm -hmm. fish. You're seeing bait fish. But that kind of comes back again to, too, if that's your priority of what you want to see. You know, if you're super concerned and want to see good returns on 2D sonar, that's what you need to have. If you're concerned with side imaging and down imaging, you've got a heck of a good transducer already. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so I think we got most of the questions here, so we're good. So, um, what have you guys been working on lately? Trying to keep up with all the uh, active target stuff, Mega Live, Live Scope. Um, you know, the live imaging stuff has really taken off in the past two years, yeah. and it's created quite a controversy as to, you know, is it too easy, or, <laughs> you know, it takes the fun out of it. Stuff. These are no different than a you know, a, a carpenter with his hammer and stuff like that. They're tools. You still got to catch mm -hmm. them. You've left the yeah. lake frustrated more times than not. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've seen a, a school of crappie outside imaging. And don't get them to bite, man. I'm throwing minnows oh, yeah. at them, everything at them. And I just not getting them. Zach, where he wants to, um, wants to, know, well, he just wanted you to talk about scroll speed for a minute. Sure. Yeah. So like I was saying, when you control the scroll speed, if you're the slower you're moving, you can crank that scroll speed down. You lower it. Um, usually they're numbered I, one to five or one to ten. Yeah. Yeah, depends, on like the unit. depends on the unit. unit. Yeah, but as you're slowing that down, you've just got to find your sweet spot. Now, um, different things like you talked about, water conditions, current, different things are going to play with this. Mm -hmm. That's something that's not going to be a set it and forget it deal. 
that's something you're going to deal with in a certain scenario. If you're running a bank on a pond, for example, if you're in a smaller body of water, you may have to adjust your scroll speed when you're running up one way with the wind yeah. and running back against the wind. It's just, it's dialing that in. And it's something that you can do pretty darn quick. I mean, you'll see the returns immediately. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as the scroll starts catching back up, then you're seeing the new feed. Um, you'll see the difference in the clarity of it. And that's um, with settings on, on yeah, any of the anything. settings. I mean, yeah. we 100% recommend play with the settings. Get used to turning yeah. the sensitivity up and down the contrast. Play with the color palette. Josh likes a different color palette than yeah. I like, but it works better for him than it does for me, and that's fine. If that helps him, great. Yeah. You know, we're all for it. What works for your eyes? Uh, the time of the day for me has a, a lot to do with the color palettes. You know, I didn't realize that was a big issue. I'm like, ah, it's just Cloudy preference or sunny. whatever. It makes a big but going from that green to that copper does make a difference depending absolutely. on the time of the day. Yeah. And water condition. That, uh, absolutely. Big one. That's a big mm -hmm. difference. And that and that's across everything, side imaging, everything. When you're having uh, rougher water conditions, the more muted palettes just work a lot better without having to go crazy in your gain settings and checking all that stuff out. You, yeah, you can really quickly just make a fast adjustment and spend more time fishing by getting that color set to get your maximized uh, efficiency out of the unit. This is our new favorite. This is lava. In it. No, this is lava. I can turn on. I'm going to turn on lava. I'm going to spin around for a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. Real quick, Zach. Uh, you know, and, and Justin, another thing I noticed is if I'm anchored up and I'm running my uh, side imaging on the slowest scroll speed and a big, I'm talking a big fish swims by, yeah. I can actually see that fish combined oh, yeah. side imaging Absolutely. and all the noise. It's yeah. like all you see is the noise and there's that fish all of a sudden. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of cool. I just wanted to add that. Uh, Trey Straub, uh, Garmin question. What's the benefit of a GPS map over an Echo Map series? Sure. So in a nutshell, GPS map is more designed for offshore and uh, where echo map is more designed for freshwater fishing. Um, with that being said, there are some benefits on the GPS map that you're probably not going to use on freshwater. You know, some of the radar functions and weather functions autopilot. and things like that. Yeah. And they, yeah. Some of the more advanced autopilot functions with that being said, um, they do have a higher screen resolution. They do have um, slightly faster processors in most cases. And the big one, you can do screen casting and screen recording. Um, a lot of times when we see folks go into a GPS, GPS map unit intentionally, it's so they can do um, screen recording through the Active Captain app. Um, for video for works, videos or, or clients if they've got other guides. clients on the boat. Uh, we see like it that. with guides a lot because they want to be able to film those experiences or cast it to an iPad or something like that on the boat in real time. Um, Echo Maps just do not have that feature. And as much as we've kicked and screamed and begged, will not, we've been told <laughs> <laughs> emphatically. <laughs> so, um, you know, another cool thing is, especially with LiveScope, um, there's two units that really stick out with GPS map and having a big advantage. And that's the 1022 and the 1222 non-touch unit. And those are in the GPS map family. Now those units have excellent screen resolution and they are really good value. So they were initially um, designed more of like a slave unit for an offshore boat. They can't mm -hmm. do sonar. Yeah, nothing. They, they can't take- On their own. Yeah, they cannot take a transducer plugged into it. But since LiveScope is an ethernet function, not a transducer function, they run LiveScope and they do it amazingly well for an outstanding price. Um, so that's, we sell a ton of those and we sell it a lot to the guy that's running uh, Lawrence, but he wants LiveScope or running Hummerbird, but wants LiveScope. Those units are absolute rock stars. Absolutely. That sounds like it'd be great for the back of a boat application. Big time. Yeah. Or we've even seen full Garmin boats, um, again, especially for guides. Um, they'll be running Echo Maps, but they'll run a single GPS map unit just for that screencast feature, which really is pretty beneficial it helps really for education for the guys that want to yeah. go out on a guide trip and truly learn the electronics because you're literally seeing on this real time of course what's going mm -hmm. on especially with live scope that's where we see it the majority of the time we've done um, we built some uh, a gps map sat for a set for um, search and rescue here locally mm -hmm. and it was really cool so we were out to go out able to go out on the lake with a, a search and rescue team well we had the unit working and showing half the people well on the other half of the boat they were looking at ipads and everyone was seeing everything at the same time um you can even do controls from ipads so that yeah that's it's a cool feature 
Very cool. Lee Evans wants us to talk a little more about the, the correct megahertz. Uh, like like we said, it's kind of like uh, depending on the conditions. Can you explain what a lower megahertz, how that's different from a, a, a higher megahertz or a chirp? Well, a chirp is multiple. Is, is that stitched together? Is that broadcasting at the same time? Or is it cycling through each one of the uh, megahertz ranges? So if you're talking about 2D sonar, it's going to be a cycle. So it's going to send an array of different frequencies, one right after the other. And then it's okay. measuring, of course, each one that comes back. And that's mm -hmm. where you get your different target separation. When you start talking about really on megahertz, I assume he's talking more about like your side imaging, your down imaging. We're talking about kilohertz and stuff like that. Again, mm -hmm. you know, your lower frequency, it's going to go out further. You're going to get farther returns from that. But you're just not getting that quality that's there. Um I don't want to throw too big a wrench in this because, again, it's a little bit confusing when I talk about the Garmin stuff. But Garmin used to have the GT30 and the GT34 a couple of years ago, two transducers that did a lot of the same features. But since they operated after different frequencies or kilohertz, we would see one was better in shallow water applications, anything like 20 feet and less. Another one was better in more deep water applications, over 20, 25 feet and better. So yeah. we were out actually outrigging boats with two different side imaging transducers, yeah. depending on their conditions of the lake that they were fishing at the time. It's an odd thing. Like you can set this kind of a rule of thumb you know, with some exceptions, but the lower your megahertz, the further you're going to get and the deeper you're going to go. You just um, lose quality, right? Generally, the, the, and that's and that where this is where it gets kind of tricky. So the higher the higher resolution, but you can only go shallower. Those really high um, output transducers, you get a diminishing return. So even though in um, you know twenty five foot less of water, they're vastly more clear than some of the lower um, hertz capability transducers. When you start shooting in deeper water, they actually are less clear. Yeah, they fade out than, than the lower hertz transducers so it's it's kind of odd um you know they they're both stronger in either deeper or shallower water and vastly weaker when they flip flop there's not a lot of middle ground there and um, that's the argument everybody's trying to find yeah right now. what one transducer can be developed that does both equally well well you, you can't f physics won't allow for it you know the right. megahertz is pretty much the length of a signal if you're too close to the return on that signal you're going to cancel yourself out so uh, it, that, that's just the way it goes you, you you can't make you know gold out of lead which is what people right. always want right it's kind of so the the new gt56 that garmin came out with you know the 54 was their first um US mm -hmm. Producer. And then they brought up the 56. Well, they lowered the frequency, which surprised gave it more power. It, yeah, it surprised people, but that's that they doubled the power output um, of that producer. So trying to make up for it. So it mm -hmm. there the 56 is good. Um, and I think what we're starting to see is where that balance is going to end up lying right. is not so much cranking this 1200, 1300 um, frequency, it's actually going to bring it back more to control closer to a thousand but amp up the actual power output. And that's where the balance is going to be found. It allows for a cleaner signal output. So Correct. <clears throat> let's see if we have any more chat in here. So, um, well, you guys have any specials going on? Let's talk about business now for a little bit. Let's, sure. let's see what you, you got to offer. Let's let, let, let the people know. Maybe they'll give you guys a call. Oh, by the way, how far are you guys from Kansas city? About two hours. Yeah. Two hours. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, uh, you guys should head out to the all American catfish deal and, Maybe we can meet up and have some barbecue together. That would be kind of cool. That sounds fun. Yeah. They don't have catfish here? What? Yeah, they don't have fun. catfish here? A <laughs> uh, couple crosses fishing. What causes loss of bottom? It only happens occasionally, uh, usually when full speed. So. Yeah, you're uh, getting air in between where your transducer is making contact with the water or turbulence or water disturbance. So um, sometimes it's caused by the transducer being mounted too low on the boat. Sometimes it's too high. Sometimes a uh, boat being over trimmed. You know, I don't know if are, are you running an aluminum boat? I guess I'll wait for him to respond. It kind of depends on the boat, too. Um, a lot of times in our fiberglass rigs, we're going to do a, a, a two transducer setup, one to shoot through the fiberglass and through the very back bottom there. So that way you generally don't lose bottom contact. And mm -hmm. then your side imaging transducers mounted up a little bit higher on the transom externally on the outside of the boat to pick up at that fast idle two to 10 or two to five miles an hour, excuse me. 
And how fast can I trust uh, my depth readings at what speed? I mean, I get a pretty good signal. I'm up to like 20 miles an hour, and I'm still getting. You gotta have miles. mapping on, and yeah, I, I I rely on topographical mapping more than I do my 2D sonar. That 2D sonar just more or less keeps it in check, keeps it true, okay. if you will. Um, but man, more times than not, I'm really looking at that mapping more than I am my 2D sonar. All right, now how much better is um, if you're using the mapping function on your units than, let's say, a, a Navionics chip? Depends, Depends on, the on the unit. unit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of them have better built in than others, you know. Um, CMAP, we're finding, is really, really, really good, good yeah. built in, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's solid. And that's something that's that's come across. You know, the different companies, they, they'll have different philosophies a bit now. You know, where um, the Navionics mapping, uh, it's odd. It, it's So they got purchased by Garmin, but they don't work on a Garmin unit. So that's kind of weird. Um, and it's going in an odd direction. So we see Lowrance really going at the C maps now, and they're excellent. Um, Garmin has their um, Ultra maps, their um, Lakeview, sorry, uh, Ultra maps, and then, of course, uh, the Lake Master stuff. It's depending on different regions, you start seeing certain brands stick out mm -hmm. um, if to say one is better than the other across the whole country, I think is pretty wildly inaccurate. Uh, but if you go region to region, you can start saying, well, this, they have the best mapping in the Southeast. These folks have the best mapping in the North, uh, you know, and sometimes plains. it's a specific lake. Yeah. So yeah. we're yeah. finding out, you know, and I, and I've witnessed them firsthand. I've seen them and run into them before like Lawrence, for example, on their sea mapping, they've got their own boats, in the water, sonar mapping today. So the data that you're getting generally is gonna be two to three years old or newer. Um, some of the stuff like Navionics and stuff like that is converting old um, land surveys and stuff like that may not be as accurate or could find some older stuff and structure that may be silted in that may still be around, maybe not. Maybe so, not. You know, a big thing years ago, a lot of guys were running like um, before Garmin mapping was really a thing, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, I myself included, I would run a hummingbird unit on my boat for one thing and one thing like I wanted that Lake Master mapping. And I was comparing my Lowrance and Navionics chip to that Lake Master. And I was looking for little differences between the two on something that maybe this one sowed a ditch over here and Lake Master didn't or vice versa, because sometimes just that little one different change, if you were paying attention enough to notice it, would make the difference on putting an extra fish or two in the boat or sometimes finding the school of fish as well. And then I'm just so a bit of a mapping rabbit hole we had to run down there. But I, I think kind of back to the original question. Um, you know, with the built-in mapping, it is getting better. Um, some of it, as far as its detail, isn't vastly better, but usually it's features that can be used as well. That's the other difference. So actually being able to adjust um, water tables live, um, it, on most of the built-in mapping is actually not even available. So you'd have to have a chip to go and do that. We live in the Midwest. We're reservoirs here in, in large right. so It's um, Our water levels fluctuate constantly and vastly um not was it last no summer before last our home lake was 17 feet up so it's something that's <laughs> it's really different you know we to be able to go in and say okay our water table's up 17 feet and have that auto calculate as opposed to trying to look at the map and do the math on your contours mm -hmm. um, that makes a huge difference and sometimes that feature alone it's like yeah that's worth you know purchasing the chip you know to be able to do those things yeah, are, are, is, do you feel that could be a trend in the future, actually connecting to, to different sources of data in order to make those types of corrections on the fly? I mean, we kind of already are. You can go out and, and truly do like sonar recordings and build your own yeah. mapping now. Okay. Um, Every a lot of them you can do like a Google Earth overlay um, to help with things as well, too, or convert like a, a waypoint that you would save on Google Earth and upload it into your unit to be able to to find that spot, you know. Um, like a lot of times when we do our research before I go fishing somewhere, I can pull up Google Earth or Bing Maps from a couple years ago and study a lake that was down 10, 11, 12 feet and find features and plug in waypoints on my unit. So when I go to the lake and the water's up, I know right where I'm casting. I can either reconfirm it with my 2D sonar or say, well, it's washed out. It's no longer there or you know, that has changed or the landscape has changed due to flooding and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So at least then I have a starting basis, yeah. you know what I mean? So, 
Uh, Lee, he just made a statement there. He says electronics are almost overwhelming. I can understand that when you first yeah. start. I sure. guess what I'm going to ask you guys is what kind of tip can you, can you give somebody like Lee who's who who feels that way? Where 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 is like the base unit to start? You allow it to be that way. Okay. True. And what I think is almost every one of these units, Humminbird, Garmin, Lowrance, they're awesome out of the box. They like, really are. Really, really awesome. Yeah. Plug them in. Spend time out on the water. Do what you're going to do out there. I really recommend taking a couple hours, though. Keep a rod and reel out of your hand and just look at the graph. Go to a lake that you have some knowledge of where there may be a road bed or a tree row and just observe the graph. You don't even have to play with the settings the first time out. Just observe the graph. Second time out, say, I want to see what adjusting sensitivity on 2D sonar does. Well, you adjust the sensitivity down, you may not see as much trash and debris, but you can still see the bait, fish, and fish. Or turn the sensitivity up and you see a whole bunch of crap coming around on your screen. You understand right. what it does. You know, and it's, and it's, again, you can overwhelm it by thinking you have to adjust so much stuff your first time out, but you don't have to. Josh didn't know anything about electronics oh, when he started. I, I was a hunter, so I got the contours, but it was backwards because I'm used to looking at uh, topo maps for mountains. Topo. Mm -hmm. So, like, so it's like, well, this is just upside down. It's the same concept, but it's upside down. I'm still looking upside at down. funnels and, and channels, and and we're just looking in the valleys. Yeah. Instead of the peaks. So it, it was. Yeah, uh, that's a good way of putting it. I I, I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah, I, I mean, it converts really well. I mean, I always joke with the guys all the time. It's like critters are critters. Yeah, and they're going to take the path of least resistance. They're going to find river channels. They're going to do where they these, feel the most safe. Exactly. They're going to feed <laughs> I, where they can hide. Um, and then when I started f fishing like that, where animals are fish or fish is the way I kind of think about yeah. it, whatever species it is, I upped my game big time. It uh, really is. I mean, if you think like if you can watch how a whitetail moves through a set of pinch points, moves through a field, goes from shelter to food, back to bed, you can apply that in, in a really large way underwater. Um, and I think people overlook that and maybe overthink that and get intimidated. I was, I was intimidated because I can't see what's going on under there. I don't know. My joke, my running joke is the your good eyes Lord, is the sonar though. That's, the yeah, that's difference. it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I said the good Lord did not give me gills nor webbed appendages. I am a terrestrial critter. And, but the thing is the learning the electronics and see it is, it's, it's like putting a pair of goggles on and sticking your head under the boat. Um, if you just let it do that and not let yourself go overwhelmed and just understand, I'm just seeing what I couldn't see before. You know, it's, it's a, it's a matter of confidence that can really, 100%. really help you. And keep at it. Once you get it figured out, once you, once you do yeah. it twice, you, you, you'll get that confidence. And, and Absolutely. Stay off. Absolutely. All right, let's go down this rabbit hole. Sweetfish 22, which I think is a new uh, uh, viewer here is asking, uh, will the ghost or force follow a contour like an Ultrex. I guess they're talking about like uh, iPilot and stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah. iPilot link feature. No, they won't. Yeah. <laughs> they won't? <laughs> they won't answer. No, not yeah. yet. Um, yeah. They're talking about uh, making that a free update in the future for that and stuff like that. Now, that is one of the downfalls is not having like the iPilot link feature to that. Um, it is newer technology in that we're seeing brush list motors. So a lot more consistent power out of them. Um, a lot more powerful for sure, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, it is some newer technology stuff for sure, but no, they, they do not allow you to follow a contour line, like a 10 foot contour line and stuff like that. You, you can still do tracks and things like that with them. Um, you just have to do it manually. Or heading along. Yeah. It's just not going to play with your map. Gotcha. Setting hooks and cross eyes says he always looks for underwater game trails. That's there you go. Yeah. About. <laughs> That's right. All right, Buckeye Catfish, I did have this up a second. I just want to make sure I didn't lose uh, Ryan's comment because it made sense with what we were talking about. Uh, compare Active Target to Mega. Well, Active Target looks great, and we have no idea what Mega looks like. <laughs> true statement. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the truth. We just we haven't seen any pictures yet. Um, of yeah. actual images. Actual, we yeah. Seen. We, we, we know what the product looks like. Right. We know about the product. We know what it's compatible with on Mega Live and stuff like that. Um, from a hardware um, perspective um, we have a little difficulty understanding the processor and how they're getting that data yeah. in so we've learned from Garmin years ago and same thing with Lowrance doing some different things and with our relationship with them anytime you've got live imaging it is a lot of raw data that's being collected I mean an yeah. absolute ton so when you're doing that 
the transducers like Lowrance Active Target, Garmin LiveScope have to have a brain box, a module. So you've got the LS uh, LVS32 module on LiveScope. You've got an Active Target module on it that processes that information like a computer, like a CPU, and sends that to the unit. Now, Mega Live does not require that. It is a sonar-based transducer that the unit processes. And they will work on the Gen 1 Solix units, which has a basic processor. So Very. We're, we're, we've seen uh, there's an offshore product that that transducer mirrors 2AT that we've seen um, pictures of, imaging of. It's very, very impressive. It's very cool. <laughs> and, and I'll be the first to say that Humminbird kind of goes against the grain of what that technology mm -hmm. is and has amazing images on side imaging. They have a very small transducer, actually, in terms of length. So they don't have a ton of array of long crystals in there like a Lowrance side imaging or the new GT56 transducer is yeah. extremely elongated. It's a long side imaging transducer. So we know from our history that the longer a transducer, the more arrays that are in there, the better the return of images is. But then Humminbird grows against the grain and throws it all off and has one so of the best side imaging images out there with a the short transducer. Short wide. I mean, it's wild. So yeah, you can't discount them that they're going to come to market. Yeah. I mean, um, and they also know what they are coming up against. Exactly. We know what yep. LiveScope looks like. We know what Active Target looks like. I mean, I couldn't imagine that they would be that foolish to come to market if they didn't have that that looks just as good, yeah. if not better. Maybe we watched a fight from Lawrence get crucified last year. And and certainly they they're not gonna do something along. Do that again. Yeah, yeah, you would think I, I, you would hope not. You know. But again, yeah, what works we're, we're very excited to see it. Um, this kind of gets to the place that, and when we say we're excited about it, you you have a choice of me personally. I like Lawrence. Yeah. I'm not saying anything Lawrence does may be better. It's just me personally. I've used it so long, I understand it. I really, really like using Lawrence, so I can stay all Lawrence from live imaging, side imaging, down imaging, mapping, everything. You're going to see the same thing now. Garmin, you can stay all Garmin from live. Uh, live scope on the bow, trolling motors now, all the way through the gamut. And then soon, Humminbird's going to be the exact same way. So you're not going to see these mismatched boats like we saw the past two and a half, three years and stuff like that. This was yeah, like the, the image for the thumbnail of this show, I actually stole off your Facebook page. And I noticed you got one of each unit on the front of a boat. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of guys do that. They actually well, do. They each are really good at one thing. You yeah, know, you've got Humminbird 360. You've got Garmin LiveScope. You've got Lowrance now with their active target, 2D sonar. They each are special. They each got their niche. Yeah. Uh, Whiskers and Stripes says, also, go out and play. Mark the fish, catch the fish. That's a big saying that's coming around in the catfish community. Yeah. Go mark that fish and catch the fish. So that's a good way of learning. Learn how uh, to size gotta... it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, how to size it, definitely. That's one thing, especially like in ice fishing. You'll see a mark. Right. You'll oh, get yeah. all ex you get all excited. You get it up as like a two-inch perch, something like that. It's crazy. We, we did that. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> we, Guilty. We really did that not that long ago in December. <laughs> That was our first time uh, big ice fishing in December. We went up there to play with LiveScope and Active Target and compared those two. And, yeah, that was a, a fun experience uh, to learn that and watch them. And by the second day, really the end of the first day, we were sizing them pretty yeah. close. Of course. Yeah, we, we, yeah. You know, we were getting there. Um, it was fun. But, yeah, the first one, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it was, you know, like a six-inch sauger come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's still good. Creole catfishing. Uh, Genesis Live on a T12. Is it possible to view a recorded contour map without recording new data, but still use sonar at the same time? If I understand correctly, yes, it is. Now, what you have to do on that, though, is when you build a map, so you've got Genesis Live, you're building a new map on that. That has to be uploaded onto that system and sent back to you and re-downloaded to your unit. Mm -hmm. And that is your mapping that you did on your lake, pond, river, section, stuff like that. So you can do a free subscription that I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uploads that to everybody. So if you go out and you do the mapping to create that lake or the sonar log and upload that, I could view that if you yeah. do the free. You can do a paid subscription, which keeps it private, which I do recommend. Otherwise, you're just allowing your competition or other people to be able to go out there and do that. Then you can re-download that on your SD card because it's reformatted through that Genesis and be able to operate that on your unit and still be able to re you know, look at your live sonar and stuff like that. But while you're doing it, if you're attempting to fish while you're doing it, you're not going to be able to 
operate doing Genesis Live at the same time and looking at your 2D sonar and utilizing it at the same time. It's kind of a of you're going out to do the work for what you want to be able to have the benefit yeah. for later. Could you do it with two units? Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're yeah, running yeah. one unit just to look at your 2D sonar and you're running there one. There you go, Jeremy. I just spent more of your money for you, buddy. <laughs> Uh, sweet, sweet fish 22 has got another question. He says, uh, can you explain the four modes on the mega 360? So are you talking like, um, you, you can lock it into side imaging. You can pull down imaging from it as well too. Then you've got your 360, which is a suite. And we call it a suite cause it's a kind of a radar array that goes around and it rotates fairly quickly. Yeah. It's like a rotating side image, right? Well, that's exactly, exactly what it is. So okay. mega 360 is taking a side imaging transducer and that's exactly what it's doing. You, it's a motorized system in there that completely rotates that around. That's exactly what that is. Then you can lock it more. You narrow can too. lock it in to have a narrow beam. I'm trying to get it. So you can lock it in like this and have a narrow beam. It's still sweeping back and forth. The thing that's a little bit frustrating about Mega 360 is it's always history. Yeah. It's not live. So some guys are like, oh, you can go find the shad if they're hanging around structure. Yes. But if you've got a ball of shad that are constantly either predator oh, fishes chasing them, they're in a creek channel winding in, you're going to make a cast and you may catch some in a cast net, but it's not real time. It's not live. So there are some limitations there with Mega 360 on – you know, certain situations like that, but it's really good for finding structure. If you're fishing a rock pile yeah. and you find another one or another brush pile over here, it definitely helps with locating stuff because you can waypoint those and then go back and start fishing your actual waypoint itself. Or if you're anchored up, I imagine it would be great. 100%. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, if you're fishing, fishing structure, which a lot of catfish guys do, you know, yep. where live scope guys fishing crappie, they're actually looking for the fish and how they react sure. to stuff. So very cool. Uh, let's see the four modes. All right, now, real quick, I know uh, we're getting bombarded, or we did get bombarded with a lot of questions and stuff. Uh, can you go through, you, you you went to the trouble of having the setup back there, maybe go through that perspective mode for everybody. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what else you have on there available to us, but uh, I'm guessing you had some stuff you prepared to get ready to share, and I'd love Listen to Listen to the fun stuff we get to play with every day, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go fishing with you guys. <clears throat> Come on down. So we were All right. talking about earlier, I think this perspective mode, again, for a hundred bucks, it's basically a mounting bracket that allows your, your uh, live scope transducer to be flipped horizontally here. So instead of, you know, being your live imaging, looking this way, you're basically taking your live imaging and doing it this way. And it's, it's kind of a sweep, like a mega 360 would be, except it's real time. So the thing that's really fun about this, that we have a lot of catfish guys absolutely love finding the shad. Like that's the number one thing. We're real close to Milford Lake. I'm sure you probably heard of Milford Lake. It's kind of famous in the catfishing world around here. They got a lot of catfish championships or fished on that lake. There's a big lull of shad in there. They can't mm -hmm. really find the shad that easily anymore. I don't know if the catfish are eating them. We got a lot of wiper in there as well too. But guys are looking at structure and being able to see house foundations. I don't know. Yeah, yeah we'll move this closer. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So here's a foundation right here. And – I know the images look amazing and people kind of say, well, I haven't had an image like this. This is a real photo that Lawrence has gone out or a real Garmin. image Garmin has gone out and actually filmed in real time. So um, we've actually gone out with Garmin, the engineer that developed LiveScope on the home lake that they do a lot of the, the demo creation on is an actual lake. It's Hillsdale. So. Yeah. yeah, we, it was really funny. The, the first time we, we went out and fished with him and we were, uh, we were crappie fishing with him and kind of learning some of the live scope stuff and going over the nuances. And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, does this look for, it's like, man, it looks oddly familiar that, like, you know, we're fishing this, this set of branches, this, uh, these Tree submerged branch. trees. Like, and he's like, well, it should, this is demo mode. And we were fishing it in real life, but it's where they recorded the demo for every Garmin unit <laughs> for forward live scope. So it was, uh, it's pretty fun to see that, but yeah, this perspective, you know, one thing to keep in mind in shallower water too, right now, the demo shows it in 27 ish feet right behind us. Mm -hmm. 15 foot. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it work well deeper than really 18 to 20. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. That was, that, that's my biggest question. So it is a shallow water tool yes, for the most absolutely. part. When you're talking to some of these catfish guys, they're fishing in 50, 60 feet of water. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is the time of year like now. So when you've got the catfish that are moving out on the shallow flats, following the shad and the Creek channels, you can, 
really easily see a winding creek channel. You can find those pinch points or where those mm-hmm. channel turns are and stuff like that. You can also see where like either got a house foundation near it, a rock pile on the edge of it. It just, it's another tool that helps. I, I know it can add to the mystery, right? By having too many tools, mm-hmm. but when you start kind of putting the pieces together, it eliminates a lot of wasted time. I mean, you get to a point where you're like, well, I'm not fishing a barren sea here. I'm going to go right. fish. Yeah. yeah. So definitely. It also allows you to, to, I always use this term proof of concept. So you need the yeah, fish there to be it. able to prove what you think is going to work, prove what you think is going to work and what isn't. So uh, that, yeah. that's I mean, actually the way I use sonar a lot. So it's a, it's a flow, you know, mapping to 2d to site imaging to live mm-hmm. imaging. And it just, you flow through that. Okay. I look at my map. I feel like they're going to be here. Now I'm going to go see if I find structure there. Now I found the structure. Now let's go see if there's fish on it yeah. and you just flow down it. And once you learn how to just make that progression, like you said, mm-hmm. prove your concept, it's if you're sitting at home and looking at a map, you can go out and prove that pretty darn quickly by following that, that flow. And then once you get clued in, it's really easy to get dialed in and look at your yeah. map and run that specific depth contour exactly. or that specific structure. Yeah, I, I have lots of those trails on my on yeah. my car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need to back that stuff up. I think it backs up automatically to Active Captain, doesn't it? As long as it I can. log in and yeah. download yeah. the data. You know, one of the things with Lawrence that I like is, is if I'm pre-fishing for a tournament, I'll run a different color trail each day. So mm-hmm. Wednesday I may run blue, Friday it may be yellow, Thursday oh, may nice. be red. So on, all right, I want to run what I ran on Friday. I'm going to go back and look at my red trail. I want to run what I ran on Wednesday. I'm going to go back and look at my blue trail and follow that for the day, depending on what you're doing. Or the conditions, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Look yeah. At Actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Like now I, I fish different, different uh, trails or I guess different, waypoints or, or the the trail markers whatever they call them sorry yeah. uh night and day so i have a separate one for each one so that would be cool hey guys it's already after nine o'clock man how time flies yeah right it's crazy. i do have a giveaway to give away we are going to add an rmp sticker to it uh so uh, i know uh our my my fishermen love decals don't they yes oh, sir yeah, absolutely they they really do so we'll give one of the, we'll, we'll give away a sticker pack to one uh uh one lucky winner after uh uh, we say good night and uh, goodbye to you guys. Um, I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot, but I don't think an hour is enough. I'd love to have you guys back in four or five months, whenever. Absolutely. Um, which you'd Nobody be willing to do to that. Talk about in four or five months. I promise yeah. you. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm sure we will. Um, you might get some emails from me when I'm ready to buy it. Hopefully, uh, everybody here in chat. Uh, that's considering buying a unit would will give you a call um i definitely think you guys uh know ex- are extremely versed in, in in all of this and you'll be more than willing to help them again it's not down to price either everybody has the yeah. same prices links are in the description i'm almost at a thousand subs guys if you're not subscribed to the channel i would really appreciate it i think before the show i was like 25 off so that's a good thing another thing if you're a podcast listener this does get converted to podcast form so you can listen to it when you're on the bank cutting the grass laying in bed whatever it's it's always fun to do that i'm a big podcast listener so i definitely went the extra mile to, to set this up and this episode will be available tomorrow all right, guys, I'm going to say good night real quick for the podcast, and after that, we will do the giveaway. Uh, oh, if you are listening on a podcast, come to the Catfish and Crop YouTube channel. You can watch this live every Monday night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. We do have some giveaways from time to time. There's a lot of good people in chat become a part of the Catfish and Crop family. Uh, you, guys will be gr- you guys won't regret it. Um, again, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. All right, folks, let's do this giveaway. I'll edit this out afterwards. So, <laughs> guys, I appreciate it. You guys coming out. If you hold on one second, let me do a randomizer here. We'll do a giveaway, and then we'll talk a little for a second a- after the show. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. You guys are probably ready. Hold on, let's see. I just learned that dog just cracked like crazy. <laughs> yeah. just like, he didn't. Hey, he, he you know, I'm surprised my dog isn't uh, snoring yet. Uh, pick a, Josh or Justin, I need you guys to pick a number one through five. Three. Right Three. Up. I like the way you guys think. Everybody else yeah, tortures right. me and gives me five. <laughs> All right. Again. Chrissy Brown, you want to 
sticker pack. If you could contact me on Facebook uh, or email me at mark at catfishandcrappie.com, I'd appreciate it. We'll get those out to you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you guys Thank for you, being Mark. on the show. I appreciate hey, it. Yeah, yeah. Hold on one second, and uh, um, we'll go from there. All right, guys, have a good night. Uh, thanks.